Hello again, it's uh, Paul Beckwith. I hope everybody is doing well, uh, you know, getting enough exercise and, uh, you know, having enough to occupy their minds to stay, uh, you know, physically and uh, emotionally, spiritually, mentally fine in these, uh, you know, bizarre times of, of um, the coronavirus. And uh, I'm going to continue talking about the uh, tipping elements in the climate system. So just to remind you, my focus um, is on the uh, Earth System Dynamics uh, review paper on mechanisms, evidence, and impacts of climate tipping elements. Please just Google it and look at the article. Bring up the article yourself. It, it, was, it came online April 21st, 2020, so it's hot off the presses. And I'm talking about the different tipping elements that are listed, that are discussed in this article. So here's where we have, uh, this is marine and sedi sedimentary sources and sinks for methane and CO2 derived from gas hydrate deposits. So we have the oceans here and we're getting an anthropogenic warming. So the warming signal is spreading rapidly through waters less than 500 meters deep. Um, so when we talk about the uh, Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf, for example, some of the largest continental shelves are in the Arctic and the water is typically less than even 50 meters deep. So the heat is going into the water and the water is heating the sediments on the seafloor and exposing the uh, methane class rates that are deep in the sediments to, um, to release. Ocean depths deeper than one kilometer can require centuries to millennia to warm in response to climate change. And the heat can go down into the sediments. Now, remember, the, the class rates can't be too far down in the sediments because we can get, we get um, heating from the earth, the core of the earth going outward. As you go down deeper and deeper into the earth, the temperature warms up. So there's a zone here where these gas hydrates can be stable. Um, as the heat penetrates down um, over time, then it can thaw these hydrates and they can come out. And if they don't refreeze, if they, if they break through the um, ocean floor, then they can come into the column of water above and they dissolve in the water. But if it's coming out in large quantities, it will go right up through the water column and go into the atmosphere. If it's uh, decomposed, it can come out as CO2. That's if it undergoes aerobic oxidation. Okay, it's broken down in the presence of oxygen and it can release CO2. But if it's coming out in large uh, quantities, it can go right up into the atmosphere. Okay, so we see that in some regions, but they say here the release from hydrates is generally very small at the moment. Okay, so uh, this shows you um, basically how the hydrates are coming out of the um, sediments at the base of the ocean floor. And in terms of the carbon stock, how much carbon is in the hydrates? 2017 estimate is 1,800 gigatons of carbon. A previous estimate in 1988 was 11,000 gigatons of carbon. So still a lot of, uh, you know, this new paper shows a lot lower, you know, five times lower five, six times lower amounts of carbon in the methane hydrate. Um, fossil fuels, to, for comparison, is about 5,000 gigatons of carbon. Soil carbon, about 1,400. Dissolved marine carbon, 980. Land biomass, um, so this is uh, the biomass. This is the plant matter, animals on the surface of the earth, about 830 gigatons of carbon peat, peat bogs, 500, so very significant, and other 67. Okay, um, so there's lots of carbon. It's just how quickly will it be released is the big question. Okay, um, another uh, topic, another tipping element is the boreal forest ecosystem shifts. Okay, uh, well, before I get there, we have the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet loss. Okay, um, so as we lose the Arctic sea ice, 
right? Then that exposes Greenland. Like I said, these things can cascade from one to the other. But in terms of the um, mass loss, both from ice, uh, okay, um, from, from marine uh, ice shelves, there's two different flavors here. There's MISI, which is marine ice shelf instability, and there's MICI, marine ice cliff instability processes. So here we have the grounded ice. This is grounded on the bedrock. In many parts of Antarctica and Greenland, we get a reverse slope bed. So as you go further away from the land, the water gets shallower. And then it, uh, you know, there can be variation here. So you can get this cavity. And so this is the grounded ice. Don't forget the ice is always flowing, replenishing out, to, out here. We've got the floating ice shelf. Okay, and we can get warm, deep water coming in underneath and melting it from below. So this is the primary mechanism in Antarctica. In Greenland, we can also get melting on the surface, melting on, melting below. Now what happens as the warming continues and the ice starts to retreat, the grounding line, which is uh, here in this case, can retreat and go into deeper and deeper water and the ice shelf can retract. And here it continues on, further grounding line retreat and loss of the ice shelf. Okay, so this is an instable, unstable, an instability, an unstable situation because the melting can increase as you go back further along because you're going into deeper and deeper water. And eventually, um, as the grounding line retreats further back, you, the belt water can come in further. Um, now, the, what happens here is the marine ice cliff instability is a similar thing happening, but you get uh, calving and hydrofracturing. Um, don't forget the tides come up and down. The ice depends on how flexible it is, but you can get these micro cracks and then you can get calving coming off here. And what happens is, is you reach a condition where when the cliff faces of the ice above the water are greater than 90 meters thick, then there's natural instabilities. The, the ice cannot support its own weight. The physical properties that hold ice together are overcome. Those, it's not strong enough to hold itself together. It's not like it's a steel wall or something. It's ice. So it fractures and you get much above 90 meters and then you just get collapse of the, of the ice. And uh, that brings you back further to even taller ice and so the collapse increases even more. So if you have 90 meters um, above sea level, then remember, you know, you'll have about nine times that, 800, over 800 meters down below onto the bedrock. Because when you go back further here, then this whole thing will start to float, the meltwater will come in underneath, and the whole process will greatly accelerate. Okay, so this is causing huge instabilities in uh, Greenland and Antarctica. Okay, so Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet loss is a huge uh, tipping element. It says Greenland can be halted if we were to cool the air above Greenland. Antarctic irreversible because it's basically the temperature of the ocean water that comes up underneath that does the, that causes a problem. Now permafrost carbon release um, we'll have a look here at the image. So here we've got um, here we've got permafrost, so ground frozen for at least two years. There's ice wedges here within the permafrost, and there's ground ice here, which is exposed at the surface. And then once it, once that's done, of course, it's going to melt fairly quickly when temperatures are above zero. And you have a river here coming down and the river heats the ground all around. So you get, so, you know, if the river course changes or if the flow rate is higher, if the water temperature is higher, then it starts undercutting. It melts out the permafrost underneath for a good distance. Um, you can get uh, collapse, instabilities in the cliffs and you can get collapse and that exposes more permafrost and greatly increases the melt rate, you can get surface water ponding, and this water is warm and the heat penetrates down and it melts the um, permafrost underneath. 
Then of course you can get fires, wildfires occurring, providing, you know, that not only does it get rid of a lot of the carbon and, and burn deeply down, you know, you can have smoldering peat underneath, but the heat also goes into the ground, further, further thawing permafrost. Um, you get grassland here as the warming increases and conditions change. You can get shrubland, you can get the forest growing and then the roots go down and you get more heat going into the ground and you get different uh, lakes and things forming, um, no longer frozen. So they melt the permafrost all underneath the lakes and then you can get the snow cover changing as well. So what we're seeing is we're seeing this is a year and this is the permafrost temperature anomaly. And what we're seeing is the temperature in, in the permafrost in the frozen ground is increasing over time. Okay, um, when, when it's around zero, it's pegged there for a while, but then you exceed that and it starts to uh, accelerate the warming. That's decreasing the permafrost area. So this is the area decrease with the different climate models here. Um, you know, and this is going out into the future. The scales here, here is for here and here is different from here. And we see that, uh, you know, with the large, with the business as usual, we get a tremendous decrease of permafrost area. And uh, of course, as the, the runoff, as, as the whole northern part, northern region warm, you get more snow melt, you get more runoff. And the, so the runoff is increasing and that also uh, melts the permafrost underneath the, the ground. So, so that's uh, that tipping point tipping element. Then we get boreal forest ecosystem shifts. So what's going on with that? Well, the boreal forest, we can divide it up into the, so these are the huge northern forests that cover Canada, cover Siberia. So in the southern margins, we can look at what happens in the southern margins, the, in, the zone, the interior and the northern margins. What's happening is the organic matter is decomposing at higher rates because it's warmer and it's being exposed. Um, we get, uh, you know, when you when you thaw it out, you get microbial decomposition and you get uh, of, of the organic matter. The warmer it is, the higher the rate. You get more wildfires in all of these areas. In the northern margins, the boreal conifers that are, are expanding and they're growing further north on previously uh, light snow covered surfaces. So they darken the surface. As, as we get warming, there's more pests that are attacking the trees that exposes them more to wildfires. Um, the carbon storage eventually shifts above ground into more robust deciduous vegetation. So as the conifers, as we get less and less fir trees and pine trees, the, the, dark, the, the dark boreal conifers, then we get deciduous trees coming in, we get grasslands, so the reflectivity actually um, changes. It, uh, it, it actually changes, so it changes the whole albedo and, uh, of, of the region. So the net effects are uncertain, but with more warming there seems to be more release from decomposition and burning of the matter in the, bore, in the soils, okay, and this can cause a, a tipping point. Um, this is some of the time scales for tipping elements and feedbacks so, you know, we're starting right now. Uh, here we go, ice-free Arctic Ocean and sun summers, loss of more than 99% of warm water corals, shifting of the Amazon rainforest to savanna and seasonal forests, large-scale ecosystem shifts in the boreal region, release of carbon from permafrost, long-term collapse of Greenland and Antarc West Antarctic ice sheets, East Antarctic ice sheets, and then less uncertain is the AMOC slowdown, changes in the monsoon uh, shift, regional shifts, methane hydrates here. So there's all of these different tipping elements and this paper models how, how much carbon is removed from them. And it actually looks at the case where there's no tipping element and where there's a tipping element. So, so this is uh, RCP 8.5 for CO2 concentration increasing is in the red and then if there's tipping elements exceeded then that will increase it so they've modeled the amount of increase due to these tipping points and uh, i'll have to continue in another video thank you for listening